Well, if you're not there already, please turn in your copy of God's Word to the book of Hosea as we dig in to our feast from the Word of God. The goal this morning is to introduce you to this life-altering revelation from God written approximately 2,750 years ago by the prophet Hosea. It's my hope, it's my prayer that this book will become a dear and trusted friend to all of us in the coming weeks as we spend much time with it. Let's pray and we will begin. God, I ask you to speak. Speak, O Lord. Unmistakably to each and every person in this room. Rattle us with your reality. Overwhelm us with this love that we just sang about. I am but a man, God. I can't do it. We need you to do it. So we ask you to do it. Holy Spirit, work in this place. Work in the temple of our hearts. Show us your glory, O Lord. Amen. Christian, you have no idea how loved you really are by God. As time passes and I'm given more and more of an opportunity to read and consider and interact and know and believe the word of God, the more the word of God consumes me. You know, I grew up fishing. <laughs> I've absolutely loved fishing since I was a young boy. It's been a lifelong pursuit, hobby, passion. But for the past few years, fishing has lost its luster in my life. I don't really fish anymore. For the past 13 years, I've been pretty passionate about hunting. The passion's all but gone. I honestly think I could part ways with all of my hunting and my fishing gear and hardly miss it. I could say the same thing about other former passions that I no longer pursue or even care about. But you know, there's one thing in this world that was given to me when I was a young boy that has captured me, that has consumed me, that has captivated and has never left me jaded. It is the word of God. It never seems to grow old. It never seems to lose its luster. The opposite is true. It seems like the more that I get to spend time with it, the more I obsess over it, the more it captivates me. The more I invest in this book, the deeper my addiction grows. I have a living, a breathing, a can't shake addiction to this book. For me, life without this book, I don't know if it'd be livable. And my obsession with this book has not left me like my other obsessions, my other passions for lesser things, fun things, good things, like hunting or fishing. You know, I've never thought about selling this book because I'm bored with it. And I thought that I could maybe move on to something else, something bigger, something better, something of higher quality, something I've never thought about doing that. And Jesus nailed it. 
He nailed it when he told the Samaritan woman at the well, you can try drinking from all these other wells, all these other things that you want to pursue and you think you're thirsty for. You can try drinking from all of them, but in the end, you know what they're going to leave you? Thirsty. Empty. Looking for something else. Jesus said, the water that I give to you, you drink it, you will never thirst again. Jesus says, if you drink of his words, the words concerning him, the words that talk about him, that alone can satisfy the whole, the size of eternity in our hearts. Not in the sense that when you drink them and read them and hear them one time and you're satisfied for the rest of your life and you can just put this book down and walk away from it and never need it again. But in the sense that once you get it, you don't need anything else. You become Come addicted to the word of God like you're addicted to air. You cannot live without it. And many of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you experience the same thing. There's a sense, and don't think too much of this, but there is a sense in which this book owns us, not in a legal sense, but in a practical sense. There is a correlation between the amount of time that we spend reading and thinking and dwelling on the words of this book and our sense of fulfillment in life. We go without this and we starve. Friends, I want you to hear There is no greater passion that you can pursue. There is no greater investment that you can make in life than spending copious amounts of time in the word of God each and every day. Why? Because I just said it. They are the words of God. 2,750 years ago, this book was written that I just read to you. How is it on our laps? The eternal, unchanging, living, abiding word of God sits on our laps. And what do they tell us? What do they reveal to us? God's glorious, immeasurable love for his people. This book is God's revelation of his love for me, for us no matter how bad or how ugly or how prideful or dense or self-righteous or greedy or idolatrous or adulterous, we get this book shows us and describes for us and assures us that we will never see the bottom of God's love for us. His love for us will never run out or dry up. No matter how sinful I am, no matter how undeserving I am, his love for me will never end. Instead of ending, it only shines brighter and more radiant. Romans chapter 9, Paul writes in verse 22, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his power known, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? 
I deserve to be a vessel of wrath. Before I became a Christian, every moment I did was seen as an act of rebellion because I failed to acknowledge him and the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Since then, since becoming a Christian, what I have done, now that I know the law of God, the word of God, the goodness of God, I continue to work against it with my actions. With my ongoing struggles of sin, I deserve nothing more than being a vessel of God's wrath. But that's not God's plan for me. The next verse, verse 23, God says, what if God did make those sorts of people, those vessels of wrath, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? That's me. A vessel of mercy, that's us. Believers, God's people. What if he did that in order to make known the riches of his glories for vessels of mercy which he's prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, even us whom he's called not from the Jews only but from the Gentiles as indeed he says in Hosea. They were not my people but I will call them my people. He who was not beloved, I will call loved. Beloved, we have no idea how loved we really are by God. And I think that's why I'm so consumed, so addicted, so obsessed with the Bible. It's here that I learn of the God who is above all gods and the mind-blowing, incomprehensible, immeasurable, inescapable love that God has for an undeserving person like me and everyone else who bows their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Though we should be vessels that have God's wrath poured out upon us, instead we find ourselves being showered with his mercy and grace as recipients of his unending and inescapable love. You know, God's love, it's often referred to by human authors using similes. We just, we just sang a simile. Your love like what? A flood. You guys, are you awake? Here we go. His love like a flood. Authors often use the simile of God's love is like the ocean. God's love is like the expanse of the sky. And there are times when these similes are appropriate. They're helpful. And there are other times when they miss the mark entirely. Especially when they seek to describe the height and the width and the breadth of God's love for you and me. The only simile that works when describing the height and the width and the breadth of God's love for his people is the expanse of the universe. You know, scientists have no idea how big the universe is. We have no tools, we have no measuring devices that can reach the end of the universe. That is, if there is an end to the universe. With our current scientific instruments, we know that the universe is at least over 93 billion light years in diameter. Can I remind you that light 
travels approximately 671 million miles per hour. There are 8,760 hours in a year. So when you multiply 8,760 by 607 million, 671 million miles, that is a number of miles that light travels in one year. That's nearly 6 trillion miles light travels in a year. Now, multiply that by 93 billion. We know the universe is at least that big. And we have no idea how much bigger because we can't see the end of it. The universe is so large, our feeble minds can't begin to quantify it. Christian, God's love for you is not like our tiny little oceans. Though they seem enormous to us. God's love for you is not like the sky. Though it seems huge to us, we can't see one end from the other at the same time. It is so big. God's love for you is like the universe. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Love never ends. You have no idea how loved you really are. No eye has seen. No ear has heard. No mind has conceived. No heart has ever understood the greatness of God's love for you. You may think you know, but you have no idea. And that is exactly why God has given us the book of Hosea. Not to show us how big God's love is, not to measure it or to quantify you, or to quantify it in our minds, but to overwhelm us with its sheer enormity. I've spent a decent amount of time immersed in Hosea, and yet I would say I have tasted but a tiny crumb of the feast of God's love found in this book. And even in that crumb, it is more satisfying, more fulfilling than anything this world has ever offered me. I've been out of the pulpit for four weeks now. Now one of those weeks was set aside to be a week of vacation and I was to go hunting all week. I spent less than eight hours hunting. I couldn't do it. I couldn't hunt. Who, ha who can chase animals when you have the love of God to satisfy you and learn of and bask in I don't turn on the television set like I used to. I don't watch YouTube. I don't have a taste for social media. I haven't even dabbled in hobbies. Why? I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by the love of God, the love that he has for me. Humbled doesn't even begin to describe. <sighs> Trembling at the love of God. I'm so undeserving of the love of God. And yet, as you work through this book, as I've worked through this book, I see the love of God everywhere in my life. God's love for me is 
pouring on me like this beautiful, this gentle, this overwhelming yet soaking, saturating shower. And it's never turned off. Everywhere I look, you can see the love of God. And the same is true for you as you treasure Christ. If you're embracing Christ as your Savior with the arms of faith, God's love for you is everywhere. And as you saturate yourself with his word, you're able to put on the glasses that help you see that life isn't about chasing silly hobbies and vain pursuits. It's about basking in relationship with the God who died to bring you to himself. Everything, to say it pales in comparison, is to do it injustice. It's not even on the radar. So I'm going to stand here and do the best I can. But I will incompetently describe to you what is indescribable, and that is the love of God. I'm here to do so the next several weeks using the words and the experiences of the prophet Hosea. And I say the words and experiences of Hosea because God's love is simply too deep. It is too complex for words. Love, it demands experience. To read of love, to hear of love, is not to know love. To know love, one must experience love. And so it was not enough for Hosea to simply speak about the love of God with words. He had to experience the vastness and the depth of God's love towards another through pain, through experience. And so as we'll learn, God commanded Hosea to marry a whore and to have children of whoredom so that he might feel, that he might experience, that he might demonstrate, that he might put on display that he might somehow communicate that which is impossible to communicate, and that is the overwhelming, inescapable love of God. Love that cannot be outran by sinners, no matter how hard we try to run from it, no matter how unfaithful we may become, no matter how much we Play the whore. Christian, beloved by God, you cannot outrun the love of God. There is no escaping God's love for you. God uses a lot of metaphors in the book of Hosea to describe himself and to describe us. A lot of different word pictures. The commentators, they call it vivid imagery. The predominant word picture used throughout the entire book is marriage. God is the promise-keeping, covenant-keeping, faithful husband that loves his bride no matter what. And God's people are his wife. The promise breaking. The covenant breaking. Unfaithful wife of whoredom. And yes, that's strong language. In my world, the language doesn't get any stronger. I struggle even using that word, especially with my kids sitting a few feet to my left. But those are God's words. They're not my words. Look again, chapter one, verse two. I read it to you earlier. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take for yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom and let, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. I wanna warn you, I wanna prepare you the same language of whoredom. It's used in every single chapter now all the way through chapter nine. 
We will see it over and over again as we work through this book. Time and time again, God's people are seen playing the whore, committing adultery against their faithful husband, the Lord. And yet, throughout the book, despite this accurate, realistic, and horrible depiction of us, we see God saying things like, in chapter 2, verse 14, maybe you want to look there real quick. He says, therefore, behold, I will allure her, I will allure my whoring wife who cheats on me, who runs out to other lovers, Behold, I'm going to lure her. I'm going to attract her. I'm going to charm her. I'm going to win her. And I'm going to bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. He's going to lure her to the beautiful wilderness and speak tenderly, gently, winning her back. This is the stuff of romantic love models, fo or, uh, novels, folks. Verse 15, there I'll give her vineyards and vineyards in the Old Testament. It represents blessing and joy and jubilation. I'm gonna give her, I'm gonna make her happy. My whoring wife. And I make, I make the valley of Achor, which literally means trouble. I'm going to take the valley of trouble where she's been living in, and I'm going to make it, it says, a door of hope. I'll take, up, I'll take your messed up life that's full of trouble. If you spend it chasing after other lovers, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to win you. I'm going to speak gently and softly to you, and I'm going to make your trouble hope. Verse 16, and in that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. Verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. And that word know, this idea of knowing the Lord is ultimate intimacy. It blows sexual intimacy out of the water. I'm going to take you whoring people and I'm going to woo you to myself and I'm going to marry you and I'm going to make you mine and I'm going to make you happy and you will know me and you will love me. The resounding message of Hosea is that the Lord will love his people no matter what. He will marshal all the power of his omnipotence to do good to you. He will do whatever it takes to keep you as his wife because he loves you. Whatever it takes. Christian, you have no idea how loved you really are. Now, to be sure, the presence of love does not mean the absence of pain. As a matter of fact, love and pain, this side of heaven, seem to be inseparable. You know, those we love the most have the capacity to hurt us the most. In addition to this, Though we love others deeply, our love for them does not immune our loved one from feeling pain. In the same way we are loved, in that same way we are loved by God, and though we are loved with a mighty and inescapable love by God, that does not mean that we as his children, his wife, are not immune from pain. Church, the presence of love is not the absence of pain. Hosea teaches us that though you are loved with by though you are loved by God with an unimaginable, inescapable love, you can't 
expect to live a life of whoredom without feeling the pain of being a whore. Can I say that again? Though you are loved with the overwhelming, inescapable love of God, you cannot live a life of whoredom and not expect to feel the pain of being a whore. This book is hard to preach. You know why? It hits so close to home. And so I tread on painful waters. Bear with me. Put yourself in the kitchen of the husband who just found out that his wife's been cheating on him. How do you think that guy feels? What do you think comes out of his mouth? How could you? I hate you. Get out. Flip over to chapter 9, verse 15. Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. This is the Lord speaking. There I began to hate them. Because of their wickedness, of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. Get out! How could you? How could you betray my love? Get out! I will love them no more. The presence of love does not mean the absence of pain. You cannot live the life of whoredom without experiencing the pain of being a whore. This isn't the kind of pain that you get over in a few seconds like when you stub your toe. It's the kind of pain that sometimes sticks with you at times even for a lifetime. There are consequences to adultery. Even when your spouse sticks with you in love, the presence of love does not mean the absence of pain. And as we work through the book of Hosea, we will see that it is full of pain. Even God's painful actions towards his people that are consequences, the consequences of their own sinful, whoring actions towards him. We know, though, that the Lord disciplines those whom he what? Loves. Hebrews 12, 6. Hosea surely shows us that though we are married to and loved by God, we cannot give our hearts to other lovers without consequence. <sighs> Those who have lived through the firestorm, storm, the firestorm, of marital unfaithfulness and have somehow survived and are still married, they can tell you that even though they're still in a covenant relationship with their husband or wife, the marriage has undoubtedly been impacted. This is hard stuff to say and even harder for some of you to hear, but again, hear me out Bear with me, when a man or a woman commits adultery, it torches a marriage like a ravenous wildfire that reduces a once beautiful hillside to a scorching barren land. Trying to survive an affair is like trying to breathe underwater. It's pain unlike any other. You feel 
lost, like someone has dropped you in the middle of the desert and plucked out your eyes and now you're desperately trying to find some place safe and you have no hope. And God says, go and marry a wife who cheats. He commands her, him, to love her. Can you imagine for a moment being in Hosea's shoes? Loving, marrying, trying to build a life with a woman who constantly cheats. You love her. You provide for her. You do good to her and for her. And she sneaks off in the middle of the night and lies naked with another man. She gives away what should be yours and yours alone. And then she does it again, and again, and again. Can you imagine what Hosea must have felt? Can you imagine how incredible his love must have been to stay with his wife? Better yet, can you imagine how incredible God's love for you must be that he stays with you? James 4.4, 4, you adulterous people. Oh, James isn't talking to Christians there. He, he, he would never call Christians adulterers. Are you kidding how can you commit adultery against God if you're not married to him? If you're not his? Christians, we have no idea how loved we are. I've got a question I want you to ponder. Would you rather be married to and love and care for a spouse who cheats on you for the rest of your life or would you rather be nailed to a cross? Because Jesus has done both. And you are both the whore that he's married to and the person that caused him to die on the cross so that he could pay for your whoring ways. What love, my God? What love? I'm gonna close, I'm out of time. I'm gonna close with the words of a singer-songwriter she portrays what I'm trying to get at pretty vividly. I love it. I've changed her words just a little bit. But this is a portrayal of God speaking to his whoring wife. I can see it in your eyes. You're going to run, you're going to leave. I can see that you're going to slip away to your other lover. But even as you run away from me over the mountains, through the valleys, I will not rest, but search east and west to bring you back to me. Even if you sail away from me across the oceans and the seas, I will move again like the mighty wind and I will blow you back to me. You will never see the bottom of my storehouses of love for you. So as you use the night to make your flight, know this, no choice that you make or path that you take will change my mind. 
Even if one day you decide you will find somewhere else to hide, I will walk your way and I will call your name and I will wait for your reply. Even if you make up your mind that you don't want to be by my side, I will leave behind the 99. Oh, that you'd be mine. I'm going to leave the 99 to make you mine. Even if you stomp and scream and huff and tell me that I'm not good enough, I'll take every swing, I'll take every blow until you know my love. Even if you beat upon my chest and tell me you don't understand, I will love you and I will teach you to love me again. Christian, you have no idea how loved you really are. God's love is inescapable. You don't have to run. You don't have to hide. You don't have to settle for the cheap embrace of an idol or secret sins or a cheap thrill or rebellious life or the arms of unbelief. You are not alone. You are loved and you are God's. Let's pray.